All right, let's get this thing started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Lindquist. And I'm the director of the Healthy Harbor Initiative at a nonprofit called the Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore. Thank you for joining us for this virtual release of the 2020 Harbor Heartbeat Report, a report that tracks our progress toward a fishable and swimmable Baltimore Harbor. This afternoon, we will be hearing from leaders in the government, nonprofit, and private sectors who have come together to make cleaning up the Baltimore Harbor a priority. Uh, we will be looking at the last 10 years of water quality data, taking a virtual tour of a new trash wheel currently under construction at a top secret location, and talking about our vision for the future of Baltimore's waterfront. First, to kick things off, I would like to welcome Michael Hankin, the president and CEO of Brown Advisory and current board member of the Waterfront Partnership, where he served as chairman for the first 10 years of our existence. Mike launched the campaign to make the harbor fishable and swimmable in 2010 and has continued to lead our work ever since. He's the architect of the public-private partnerships that have defined our work over the last 10 years and is a huge advocate for promoting the civic duty of the private sector here in Baltimore. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Adam. Are we good to go? Great. Well, I'm very, very lucky I'm sitting here in a conference room at Brown Advisory, looking out on a beautiful day on the harbor. And I can tell you, it looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago. So every once in a while, you see a problem that just cries out to be solved. And many days we walk away from it. But 10 years ago, we knew the right thing to do was to walk right up to it and try to solve it. And we knew the harbor was in an unacceptable condition. But we also knew because of several things coming our way, financing, regulatory uh, changes, uh, greater recognition by the citizens of Baltimore about the problem, that if we put our mind to it, we could do it. We knew that it was possible. And back then, 2010, 10 years seemed like a long time off. And Fortunately, we got a lot of work done. We have wonderful partners, the city, state, environmental partners in our community, especially Blue Water Baltimore. It definitely wasn't easy. There were times where there were some real technical challenges that were hard to figure out. We, had, we participated in the negotiations with EPA and the city. Uh, Blue Water led the way um, on much of it to put in place a modified consent decree that provided a lot of legal support for what needed to happen. The uh, stormwater fees provided a lot of creative financing. We were very, very lucky, and we were able to meet each of these challenges and move forward. We also picked up a fantastic teammate that is known around the world everywhere. Mr. Trashwheel, you'll hear more about him or an update on him later and his good friends, professor, captain, and soon to be someone else. He and his fans gave us a lot of hope and provided the grit we needed in years when we knew we weren't making as much progress as we needed to be. Frankly, we and we've also learned a lot about the impact of the harbor on every neighborhood in this city. In every neighborhood, there is a backyard stream. Sometimes they're hard to find, but for many of our citizens, this is the only window to nature in their community. All of these streams meet at the harbor, and we know that if the harbor is healthy, then we've done a much better job of taking care of the neighborhoods as well. So here's the main takeaway from today's announcement. The harbor is cleaner, much cleaner than we, when we started it 10 years ago. And we have the data to prove it. Today, the harbor is just as swimmable as bodies of water located in or adjacent to other cities across the country. Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington, DC. 
Like those cities, the harbor isn't going to be swimmable every day. No urban waterway is or can be. But it's time to shift from a, a big campaign, clean up the harbor, make it swimmable and fishable, to something that is managed, just like these other cities have done over the last 10 years. Water trails, notification systems, and even a seasonable swim site. I promise that a year from now, as soon as we get through the pandemic, we will celebrate on a day with a lot of fanfare, recognized, I'm convinced, around the world by a swim where I'll jump in and swim across the harbor. It's doable. I look forward to uh, having a lot of folks who are on the webinar today participating with me. We proved that this city can do something big when it puts its mind to it. With our partners in government, with our partners in the environmental community, with nonprofit support, we can get the job done. And that's a big deal. That's a lot for Baltimore to celebrate. So I look forward to listening to the rest of the webinar with you. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce City Council President Brandon Scott, who is also the Democratic nominee for mayor. He is also someone who sees a tough problem and walks toward it, trying to solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you for your dedication to our city and to our harbor in particular. Uh, I am excited to be here today to talk about our harbor. As we know, uh, growing up here in Baltimore, I remember as a kid coming down to the harbor and, and, and thinking about why, uh, you know, my parents would say that I couldn't put my hands in it or when I asked why couldn't we swim in it and then saying that uh, because it was too dirty because it wasn't clean enough and and just imagining what was the possibilities of a harbor that's clean and today because of all the hard work of all the folks who have been working together uh, the conservationists and all the folks at the healthy harbor uh, initiative we are seeing progress and I think that now we see this progress we can see the unlimited potential that we can talk about our great harbor. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was filming a video uh, down by the harbor and I saw something that I had never seen in my life. I saw both jellyfish, crab and fish swimming actively in the harbor. Uh, for me, uh, that was such a big deal that I called both of my younger brothers who no longer live in Baltimore and said, you won't believe what I just saw. And I actually sent them a video of it because they still didn't believe me when I said it to them over the phone. Uh, that's the kind of potential that we have here. And we have to credit the work to the folks who have been dedicated to this, everybody in private industry, nonprofit, government coming together to realize that this issue is one that can be solved if we focus on what we have to do to bring it to fruition. And as we continue to see life blossom back into the harbor, I encourage everyone to continue to do their part by keeping our hollow clean and thriving, by thinking about how you uh, use your waste and all throughout the city, helping us to reimagine how we use waste and, and get rid of waste in Baltimore City, how we uh, deal with our storm drains, how we do everything in our city to protect uh, a jewel of the city, to allow it to be a place where we have uh, swim sites, where we can come out and kayak, which is something that I absolutely look forward to doing on our wonderful harbor. That's the kind of thing that we can do. Uh, Baltimore can do big, we can do big, but we can only do big and better together. And that's the vision that we have to have moving forward. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak with you for a few moments, and I look forward to my kayaking trip in the harbor very soon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council President Scott. Um, and thank you to Mike as well, both of you, for your inspiring words. Um, and Council President Scott, we are going to get you out on the kayak in the harbor. Uh, I promise you that. And Mike, I'm looking forward to jumping in with you um, as soon as this pandemic uh, is behind us, which will hopefully be sooner rather than later. 
Um, so I guess up next, we're going to hear from the acting director of Baltimore City Department of Public Works, uh, Matthew Garbark. Uh, director Garbark was appointed acting director um, effective February 1st of this year. Uh, but Mr. Garbark has 13 years of experience in state and local government. Prior to his current role, he served as deputy director of DPW, where he was responsible for a great many things, including the city's sustainable energy portfolio and the city's environmental police. So thank you for joining us. Welcome, Director Garbark. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, this is such a great event. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you and provide some updates on what we've been doing as um, the city, as the Department of Public Works, to help um, ensure and maintain a clean and healthy um, harbor, which we, as we all know, is vital to both the city of Baltimore as well as the larger region, the Baltimore metropolitan region. Um, a cleaner harbor is going to allow this true environmental treasure to reach its full recreational and economic potential. And that's going to have tremendous benefits to the entire region. Um, we're making a lot of progress and we're seeing a lot of positive results. And some of the things that we're doing, I just want to touch on briefly from DPW that is um, affecting this and that we are going to continue to pursue um, are, are some of our major, major projects, specifically our Headworks project over at the Back River Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's a close to a half a billion dollar investment that is going to relieve um, what we are estimating to be 80% of the entire volume of sewage leaks um, into streams and waterways. So we think that this will be a tr true, true game changer that is going to take the health of our harbor and our streams and, and our waterways to just a, a much, much higher level. Um, that project is on schedule and is on budget. And we are expecting it to meet conditional acceptance, which is one of the milestones, um, by October 31st, 2021. Um, the facilities are going to be in place, and we expect them to be functional uh, in early 2021. So we are going to start using um, the facilities and start seeing the benefits uh, very soon, very, very soon. Um, we also last year announced the completion of our enhanced nutrient removal project at the Patapsco Wastewater Treatment Plant. We're also working on one at the Back River uh, treatment plant as well. That is gonna remove up to 95% of contaminants in sewage wastewater. It'll be some of the cleanest wastewater in the state, if not the country, that'll be going back into the waterways. So all of these things are providing just a, a true benefit to enhance the cleanliness and the quality of, of our harbor. Um, we're also very focused on, li on limiting some of the remaining uh, structured overflows. These are areas where if, the if there is a backup because of wet weather, the sewage, the wastewater um, can sometimes back up and it goes out these overflows directly into our streams. These were built 100 years ago and we need to work to close them. Uh, we're working currently along the Falls Road corridor. Uh, it's one of our major consent decree projects and it's going to eliminate two of these structured overflow sites. So that's gonna also reduce the amount of sewage going directly into the Jones Falls, which as we know, is a major tributary to the harbor and, and the bay. Um, we also announced the completion of our Less Waste, Better Baltimore uh, long range operational plan, which um, we are very excited about. It, it sort of lays out a roadmap for near and long-term uh, strategies for us to help maximize our waste reduction and diversion um, and do it in, in a sustainable and financially feasible way. We know one of the big issues that we see is litter and other um, debris and trash uh, getting into our waterways, clogging our storm drains, and actually, you know, contaminating the harbor as well. And we really, really hope that this is going to be leading us into a different way of thinking about our waste. Um, as uh, Council President um, Scott said, you know, reimagining our waste, figuring out a way to handle it, dispose it, and you know, reuse and, and recycle more. Um, this plan is in, intended to look at some of these major options, such as uh, diversion, recycling, and disposal, and we're going to use the city's ad uh, adopted climate action plan and the 2019 Baltimore Sustainability Plan to help guide these principles as well. So um, we remain strongly committed 
uh, to supporting recycling. And I know that we had to make some modifications recently. It, it, it was something we did not make lightly. It was something we resisted till the very, very end, but we needed to make those changes in order to protect trash service. But it is such an important thing that we have created uh, 14 uh, recycling centers in each of the city council manic districts so that people can take the recycling and drop it off. Um, we've also collaborated with federal um, other city agencies, as well as other nonprofit and community partners for our GROW centers. That, that stands for Green Resources and Outreach for Watersheds. Um, so we've had these events across the region, across the city, and these uh, GROW centers, they're intended to be greening resource hubs with the goal of increasing citizen capacity to um, implement community greening and stormwater management projects. So these hubs provide residents with access to free or low cost materials. They, we provide plants. We also provide training and information to develop skills and connections for undertaking some of these projects. Uh, next month, we're gonna hold our first grow center since the COVID pandemic. It's gonna be a mini grow center event and it will be held in conjunction with a free community shredding event at October on October 3rd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m at uh, 2801 St. Lowe Drive. So that's in, the Clifton, in Clifton Park. So I just wanna thank everyone uh, on the public side, private side, on our nonprofit side, who work together at um, Healthy Harbor. Uh, the news and this information and where we are is, is truly encouraging, but I, I, I commit to you that we will not rest, and I'm sure none of, none of us on this webinar will rest until we get the harbor as clean as we can and keep it as clean as we can. So I really want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and I'm very happy to be here. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, Director Garbark. Thank you for your leadership at the Department of Public Works and for joining us today. And once again, a big thank you to Council President Scott and Michael Hankin. I think the three of you do an excellent job of representing the public-private partnerships uh, that helped to launch the Healthy Harbor Initiative uh, 10 years ago and continue to push it forward today. Uh, next. I'm going to be joined by our staff scientist, Tiffany Kim. Good afternoon, Tiffany. Good afternoon, everyone. So Tiffany and I are gonna dive deeper into the data. Uh, dive deeper, look at this photo. Uh, we're gonna dive deeper into the data that supports our new 2020 report on water quality in Baltimore's harbors and streams. You're looking at a rendering of kids swimming in the harbor, and this is an aspirational image that we've been using to promote this event uh, without a lot of context, uh, just to kind of pique your curiosity. Uh, but the time has come to provide some more context to this image. So uh, over the last 10 years, there have been some incredible progress um, that you've heard about today, um, and much of which would not have happened or has happened as quickly without the partnerships we're celebrating on this call today. And our report includes some terrific timelines that go into these efforts in more detail. And I thought it would be good to just kind of go through maybe a greatest hits of some of the uh, things that have happened over the last 10 years to get us to the point we're at today. So in April 18th, on April 18th of 2010, the goal of a fishable, swimmable Baltimore Harbor was first announced by the Waterfront Partnership. And in 2011, we followed that up by installing the harbor's first 400 square feet of floating, wet, of floating wetlands. That's a project that both restores habitat and helps to filter pollution out of the water. Since then, of course, the National Aquarium and Brown Advisory have installed their own beautiful floating wetlands. In 2012, we partnered with Blue Water Baltimore to start releasing annual report cards, just like the one we're releasing today, based on data collected and analyzed by the Baltimore Harbor Waterkeeper. 2014 saw a number of new efforts, including the Great Baltimore Oyster Partnership, a collaboration with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which has since grown over 1 million oysters in the Baltimore Harbor. Baltimore City also expanded its street sweeping program. And of course, Mr. Trash Wheel was born in May of that year and has since picked up over 1,500 tons of trash and debris from the water. In 2015, the Baltimore City Department of Public Works first publicly identified the source of over 80% of our sewer overflows, which Director Garbark just mentioned, uh, being caused by this misaligned sewer pipe, uh, which causes a persistent 10 mile backup of sewage beneath the streets of East Baltimore. More on that in just, just a moment, but in 2016, Baltimore City distributed municipal trash cans to every home, providing cans to many residents who had not previously been using them 
And uh, for anyone who doesn't know the connection between providing trash cans and swimming in the harbor, uh, not using a trash can can result in trash ending up in our streets and alleys, and then rain washes them into our storm drains, which flow unfiltered into our streams and our harbor. In 2017, the city broke ground on the Headworks project, which Director Garbark just mentioned. Um, that's the project to alleviate that 10 mile sewage backup discovered in 2015, uh, the one that's causing 80% of our sewer overflows. 2018 saw the launch of some great community beautification programs, including the city's Be More Beautiful campaign, as well as our own Green Stoop Challenge. And in 2019, Maryland became the first state to ban foam food containers, a frequently littered item that Mr. Trashwheel has collected over 1.2 million of. And of course, this was followed in January of 2020 by a ban on plastic bags here in Baltimore City. And lastly, over this 10-year period, the Chesapeake Bay Trust has invested $4.4 million in restoration projects in Baltimore City. Some of the 82 projects they've funded include planting 300 street trees in East Baltimore, installing bioretention cells to capture runoff from parking lots at MedStar Harbor Hospital, and building a rain garden right by Professor Trashwheel. So an incredible amount of great work and great projects, many of which have garnered attention in local and national media, or in the case of Mr. Trashwheel, even international media. And they've really helped make Baltimore a global leader in the restoration of urban waterways. Uh, for example, I get calls and emails every week from cities all over the world interested in bringing Mr. Trashwheel to their shores. But of course, the question is, what do we have to show for it? Is the harbor swimmable? And that sounds like a pretty basic question, but it's actually a bit more complicated than most people realize. As um, Mike mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there is, a, there is no urban waterway that is swimmable all the time. In fact, even beaches throughout the Chesapeake Bay are not swimmable all the time. That's because rain washes pollutants off the land and into our waterways and seeps into our sewer systems, causing them to overflow. So what does that mean for the harbor? Well, it means that in dry weather, the harbor is swimmable a majority of the time, and monitoring shows that it's getting better. But we aren't recommending that anybody jump in just yet. That's because even as the water has gotten cleaner, there are other things we need to consider before taking a swim. First, the Baltimore Harbor has many uses, including industrial ports and recreational marinas, and swimming should take place in a designated area that protects swimmers from boat traffic. Like many urban waterways, the sediment at the bottom of the harbor contains legacy pollutants from old industry that should not be stirred up. And this is something a lot of cities struggle with. And the long-term solution is to let cleaner sediment cover over the polluted sediment. In the meantime, cities have been able to build swim sites and host events safely by keeping swimmers from coming into contact with the bottom, either by swimming in deeper water or having a barrier between swimmers and the bottom. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, just like every public beach in Maryland, swimmers should avoid contact with water for at least 48 hours after a rainfall. So keeping all of that in mind, I'd now like to invite Tiffany to discuss what we've seen in water quality trends in 2019 and over the last 10 years. Tiffany? All right, thanks, Adam. Um, so we're going to take a look at water quality in two different ways. Uh, first, we'll look at fecal bacteria scores, which are relevant to human health and contact with the water. And then we'll also take a brief look at various ecosystem metrics that give us an idea of overall environmental health. And next slide. <laughs> so um, a few things to keep in mind when we look at these bacteria scores. Number one. Uh, fecal bacteria levels are used to assess the risk of human illness from direct contact with the water, and that's because these bacteria come from sewer overflows. So for this report, we used the most conservative safety threshold there is to determine whether a water sample passed or failed. And when a sample passes, that means that there is a low level of bacteria and a low risk of illness, although that is never zero risk. Uh, secondly, the bacteria scores are shown in percentages, and so these are the percent of passing samples in a given year. Um, bacteria levels can change pretty drastically day to day, so you can sort of think of the scores as telling us the percentage of good days, um, meaning the best scores would be 100%. That would mean all the samples taken that year had passed. 
And lastly, this 2020 report only includes dry weather data in the calculation of bacteria scores, which we define here as at least 48 hours after a heavy rain. And we did this to control for different amounts of rainfall between years. Um, since this is the first time that we're looking at long-term trends. We know, like Adam mentioned earlier, that bacteria levels are heavily influenced by rain. So we took out that variable in order to make the scores more comparable between years and to see if there were any underlying trends. So in this map, you can see that the most recent 2019 bacteria score at each sampling station uh, is uh, next to a symbol that indicates the long-term trend at that station. So for example, in the outer Patapsco region, um, we can see that most of the stations do not, have not shown any trend over the years, but I can tell you from looking at the data that that is because the scores have been consistently very high. Um, whereas when we look at the inner harbor in this area, do you have it? Yep. <laughs> Um, we can see that we clearly have room for improvement, uh, but most of these stations for which we have multiple years of data are showing a statistically significant positive trend. Um, and the breakdown is on the graph on the left. Uh, this graph shows bacteria scores over time. So at the bottom, you can see um, the years and each point will show you the annual bacteria score for one station. So for example, that uh, right that point right there um, shows the score is 50% at the Jones Falls outlet in 2019. Um, and whereas the score was 100% at Northwest B, which is around Locust Point uh, in 2019. And the blue line is the, tr the trend line taking into account all the stations in this region overall. So you can see that um, we have seen a, a significant improvement in the harbor um, and the station with the highest, with the most improvement has actually been the one that has tended to score the lowest in past years and that would be the Jones Falls outlet. So that's good news. Um, in the middle branch, which is an area south of the inner harbor, um, we don't really see any positive or negative trend uh, since 2009, although the scores have generally been consistently higher than the Inner Harbor overall. Um, but we have seen a lot of improvement in our freshwater streams as well. And if you take a look at the, so we're going to take a look at the Jones Falls watershed and the Gwynns Falls watershed. In the Jones Falls, this is the watershed that flows into the Inner Harbor. And you can see on the map that not at nine out of 13 stations, uh, we've seen significant improvement in bacteria scores and all but one of the rest shows some improvement as well. Um, and if you look at the graph on the left, we're not quite sure why there was such a big increase in scores in 2017, um, but that improvement has held steady for at least a few years, which is great and suggests that uh, hopefully that improvement in bacteria scores is not a fluke. And lastly, the Gwynns Falls watershed, this is the uh, river, that, the stream that flows into Middle Branch. Um, and the improvement has not been quite as dramatic as in the uh, Jones Falls, but you do see that again over time. Um, we do see better scores now in the past few years. And uh, overall six stations are significantly improving, six are at least slightly improving, and only a couple have shown no change. Um, so fortunately, overall, none of the stations in the streams or in any of our tidal waters have shown that fecal bacteria has gotten worse over time. Uh, and, and so it's generally good news for the bacteria scores, which are, again are relevant for indicating the likelihood of contracting an illness through contact with the water. Um, now we're going to switch shift gears and we're going to take a brief look at ecosystem health metrics to get an idea of environmental health. And unfortunately, in this case, we have not seen similar improvements in ecosystem health metrics. Um, the graph on the left is for tidal waters and the graph on the right shows different parameters for the streams. And there are a lot of different metrics shown here. Uh, I won't go into all of them right now, but um, you can take a look at all of them and what they mean in the report. Uh, but the main takeaway is that the data shows that ecosystem health continues to face great challenges, particularly with excess nutrient pollution, um, clarity and algal blooms in the harbor, and conductivity in our streams. 
So in conclusion, um, progress has certainly been made. We see that bacteria spores are improving and we think that's likely due to the hundreds of millions of dollars that the city has put into, uh, has invested in our sewer repairs. Um, this analysis, of course, doesn't look at causation, but we can't think of a likely alternative reason. And, uh, and we expect to see that that positive trend will continue with the Headworks project and, um, and other pipeline improvements. Uh, but the ecosystem data also shows us that we really need that same investment in green infrastructure. And that would mean more trees, rain gardens, bioswales, generally more pervious surfaces and ways to mitigate stormwater runoff, erosion, and flooding. And all of that is really difficult, but it's going to be necessary if we're going to have truly healthy waterways in our future. So now uh, I'll hand it back over to Adam. All right. Thank you, thank you, Tiffany, for that great analysis. Um, and also another shout out to Blue Water Baltimore for their excellent water quality data that made that analysis possible. Uh, next, I'd like to talk a bit more about Waterfront Partnership's vision for the future. Uh, of course, the fishable swimmable goal has gotten us to this point, but where do we go from here as we begin to manage our waterways for recreational use? How do we increase paddling in the harbor? How do we work to shift public perception about swimming? <clears throat> and how do we use the harbor to connect people to the local environment so that they become stewards and advocates for its continued restoration. Well, we started by looking around at what other cities are doing and we found urban water trails were definitely helping to build connections between people and their waterways. Uh, we looked at trails in New York, in Buffalo, in Milwaukee, and other cities where they are investing in infrastructure to help get people safely on and off the water, where there are amenities for paddlers, parking, restrooms, rental facilities, and clear rules about where and when to paddle. We also uh, found urban swimming events in Portland, pictured here, in Chicago, in Boston, and as well as in Washington, DC, where communities are reclaiming their post-industrial waterways for casual recreation and even swim races. Uh, and then we looked at what these cities were planning to do next. In Boston, after many years of hosting one-off public swim events, the Charles River Conservancy has built up enough support to plan the Charles River Swim Park. The proposed area would include a false bottom to keep swimmers from touching the sediment of the river and allow for a variety of controlled depths for different swim abilities. In Washington, DC, the Anacostia River Pool is considering many different models for swimming facilities, including a full-sized lap pool, a shallow splash pad, and a deep pool for diving, or something that includes all of these options. Uh, the goal of the swimming facility is to allow people to swim or wade directly in the water, uh, into the river water, without filtration. <clears throat> and a lot of people have heard about Plus Pool in New York City. It has not been built yet, but is pictured here in a rendering near Brooklyn Bridge, uh, next to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, unique to the Plus Pool is a filter technology that's still being developed uh, which would filter river water as it passes from the river into the pool. Uh, if this technology is proven to be viable, it may have applications in cities around the world. We also looked at what projects are already implemented, and for that we turned to Europe. Uh, in 2017, a swim site was added to this canal in Paris. And um, I can tell you, I've toured the sewers of Paris, um, because I guess that's my idea of fun on a vacation. Uh, and their water quality concerns are no less than Baltimore. In fact, they have some even greater challenges than we do in Baltimore. Uh, but even they recognize the value of recreating in natural waterways and figured out how to do it safely. And it's extremely popular. This harbor bath in Denmark allows swimmers to enjoy a circular diving pool, a children's pool, a 50 meter lap pool, or one of two saunas tucked underneath the boardwalk, which doubles as a viewing platform. So the question is, how can Baltimore join these other cities? Uh, we think the harbor is ready for water trails. And once the Headworks project, project is completed, even one-off swim events. But what about a more permanent swim site? Well, we thought it was time we started to imagine what that could look like. So without further ado, I'm excited to share with you all on the call today for the first time ever, uh, the Harbor Swim Spot, a conceptual rendering of what swimming could look like in the Baltimore Harbor. The swim spot is a floating modular swim area that is enclosed on all sides, but allows people to swim safely in harbor water. 
The swim spot would also include a kayak launch and kayak rental facility, concessions, and even floating wetlands that would attract fish, birds, and other marine life. And the yellow spot in the middle is actually a trampoline for leaping into the water. Uh, this rendering shows the swim spot in the inner harbor near the Science Center, but it could theoretically be positioned at other waterfront locations around La La Baltimore, like the Canton Waterfront Park or the uh, Middle Branch Rowing Club. You would access the swim spot via ramps that allow you to walk out onto the structure <clears throat> away from the bulkhead and the promenade to an area where the water is deep enough that swimmers won't come into contact with the bottom. This is a rendering looking into the swim site from outside the structure where you might kayak by some floating wetlands or see people dangling their feet in the water. Now, this is aspirational, but it's an exciting glimpse of where we can go next as we continue to see the benefits of sewer repairs and cleaner water. Now, some of you might ask why, given all the challenges we face today, should we care about paddling and swimming in the Baltimore Harbor? And it's a reasonable question. Uh, and for me, the answer is because we do a disservice to the residents of Baltimore if we continue to shun our waterways when they should be our greatest natural resource. Uh, the Baltimore Harbor is our gateway to the Chesapeake Bay, to outdoor recreation, and to environmental stewardship. And the people of Baltimore have paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fees and taxes over the years to clean it up. And there's still more work to be done, especially as Tiffany said, in, regarding, uh, in regard to stopping polluted stormwater runoff when it rains. Uh, but the progress we've made in terms of removing trash and repairing our sewer system mean that it's time to ensure that Baltimoreans reap the benefits of the restoration they have paid for. It's time to start managing the harbor as a recreational resource for the city and the state. All right, thank you. Now I would like to turn it over to Jen Iosa. Uh, Jen has been the Executive Director of Blue Water Baltimore since 2017. Prior to that, she was the Vice President and Director of Programs at the Chesapeake Conservancy. She's also worked as Senior Scientist for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and as Senior Conservation Manager at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, we've been partnering with Blue Water Baltimore for over a decade now on many different projects, but especially on water quality monitoring. Uh, the monitoring program that Blue Water Baltimore implements is the best in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more about it. So thank you, Jen, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Adam, for those kind words. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, as Adam said, uh, I'm the executive director of Blue Water Baltimore. Uh, we are the regional water uh, watershed organization and the home of your Baltimore Harbor Waterkeeper. And our goals are really to protect and restore uh, water, our waterways across the city um, and the county that ultimately flow both into the harbor, the Patapsco, and the, the Chesapeake Bay. And we wanna do that not only to promote um, environmental quality, but also to promote quality of life and thriving communities. Um, because our waterways really do connect um, a great diversity of communities across the region. So Blue Water Baltimore is a, is a science-based organization. And as Adam noted, um, we are the, the organization that undertakes the long-term monitoring um, upon which um, Tiffany's presentation was, was largely based. Um, starting uh, before uh, 20, 2010, um, our Baltimore Harbor Waterkeeper started doing routine monitoring of um, the inner harbor because we suspected that we had um, pollution problems associated with the, the infrastructure of our sewer network. And we wanted to be able to demonstrate definitively um, that that was the case. And from there, our monitoring program has grown over the last 10 years. We monitor 49 sites across the Jones Falls, the Gwens Falls, and the Tidal Potomac, from the headwaters in Baltimore County, through the city, into tidal waters of the Chesapeake Bay in Anne Arundel County. And we collect routine um, uh, samples for not only bacteria, but a variety of parameters that give us information about the ecological health of our waterways and the bigger um, ecosystem in, in Baltimore City. Um, and we share that data 
uh, freely um, and for free with a variety of partnering organizations around the region. So academic institutions and researchers, as well as partners like the Waterfront Partnership in the city of Baltimore. All of that data is available on a special website that we call baltimorewaterwatch.org um, so that any resident, any, any student, um, or, or any stakeholder can take a look at up-to-date information. We are also um, a, a regional advocacy organization, and we are strong proponents for resident engagement um, in, in the health of our waterways, both protecting it and restoring it. I think Adam noted earlier, we've seen a really great example of partnerships with our city government. Um, and we believe in strong partners there as well. But we also work to engage citizens who live in and, in and around um, Baltimore City. We work to encourage Baltimoreans to speak up for the things that they care about. Uh, for their access challenges, uh, their neighborhood concerns, and the solutions that they want to see um, along their local tributary, in their communities, um, and broader, more broadly within, um, within the city. Two recent um, successes in the advocacy arena, uh, Adam noted the um, statewide ban on expanded polystyrene and, and plastic bags locally. Um, I also want to note that just this Monday evening, our Baltimore City Council passed the first of a few protections for city trees, which is probably one of the most effective ways that we can protect and improve water quality is by increasing tree canopy and the number of trees that are planted along our streams. So we are taking strides in the right direction um, with our local laws and our state laws. And those wouldn't have happened without community engagement. Um, so as Tiffany noted, you know, we have seen uh, improving trends in bacteria at 34 of our 49 sites over the last 10 years. And we're really, really pleased to see that because we believe it is an indication that the work that the city and the county are doing relative to improving our sewage infrastructure is working. The, the, the less positive news uh, that Tiffany hit on is that the ecological um, indicators of waterway health, things like nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment and water clarity, unfortunately are not as proving, uh, improving as, as much as we are seeing um, with bacteria. And at many of our non-tidal sites, we're seeing decreasing water quality related to these parameters. And so what that says to us is that we need to be putting the same kind of, of uh, resources and focus on improving our stormwater network um, as we have been in the last 10 to 20 years um, at improving our, our sewage treatment and our sewage network. Um, and so for Blue Water Baltimore and a lot of the partners with whom we work, we will continue to advocate for ongoing improvements in our sewer network, as well as increased resources and increased focus on improving our stormwater network so that we can begin seeing um, longer term improvements in our, our non-tidal waterways in a, a whole host of ecosystem health parameters. So at Blue Water Baltimore, we are cautiously optimistic that we're moving in the right direction. Um, but we also know that the challenge uh, remains in front of us and that we still have work to do. Um, and we also really firmly believe that that work is not for one of us alone. It is not just the city's burden or the Waterfront Partnership bur per Watership Partnership's burden or the county's burden. It really is for all of us to play a role because by working together, we do firmly believe that we can achieve much more than any of us could do alone. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Adam. I will uh, thank the Waterfront Partnership for inviting me to be here today. 
Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for those kind words and uh, for joining us today. Uh, I think we can all agree that the, yeah, the future of Baltimore isn't isn't just blue, but green, as in we need to see more, more green infrastructure uh, so that we can start to improve our ecosystem scores uh, as much as we've seen improvement in our, um, our bacteria and uh, fecal bacteria scores. So thank you for joining us. Um, now I'm excited to turn it over to John Kellett uh, in Pasadena at the headquarters for Clearwater Mills. Uh, John has been working on cleaning up the harbor for well over a decade. Uh, before starting his own company, he worked as a shipbuilder and the director of the Maritime Museum for the Living Classrooms Foundation. He invented the trash wheel in 2007 and has since built three of them that Mike named earlier, Mr., Professor, and Captain. Uh, the last of which is actually owned by the Maryland Port Administration. Uh, Water Partnership actually owns Professor and Captain, and we will also own the trash wheel that he is building right now. John is here to give us an update on the un <clears throat> currently unnamed fourth trash wheel uh, that's being built as we speak. John, thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you are coming through. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Hey, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. Um, I know I'm speaking for my whole crew that we're really glad and happy to be a part of this overall effort. And the trash wheels get a lot of attention as, as, as sort of a highlight of the effort. But as you heard today from uh, the webinar and the rest of the webinar, there's a lot of other things going on that make just as much a difference as the trash wheels do. But uh, we're glad to be a part of the effort. And the joining that effort is the trash wheel that's right behind me. And hopefully it'll be in about Less than two months, we'll be ready to have uh, the trash wheel, the biggest trash wheel yet join the effort. It'll be the fourth trash wheel in Baltimore, and it will be the biggest trash wheel yet. Uh, just a little bit bigger than Mr. Trash Wheel. The crew likes to say it's going to be the best trash wheel yet, but we don't want uh, Professor or Mr. Trash Wheel to hear us say that, so, or Captain Trash Wheel to hear us say that, so we'll keep that quiet. But they like to think it's going to be the best one yet. And um, the reasons it's going to be the biggest one yet is because the Gwynn's Fall is, is a major contributor of trash to the middle branch of the harbor. There's a lot of trash that flows down that river into Baltimore Harbor, and it's got to be big enough to handle the job. The other, another important reason is that it sits sort of a little bit shaded by the overpasses uh, off of I-95 and 395, and we need to put a lot of solar panels on this covering structure so that we can maximize the direct sunlight that the location does get. So you'll see that the covering structure, hopefully you can see it behind me right here, the covering structure is quite large and it's going to have twice as many solar panels as uh, Mr. Trash Wheel has. And, but it's close, the rest of it's kind of close in, in dimension to the Mr. Trash Wheel, because Gwynn's Falls is a similar river to the um, Jones Falls in many respects. And we are making some really good progress on this trash wheel. We are at the point where most of the pieces have been fabricated, and now we're getting to the point where we're starting to put them onto the floating platform. Right over here, we'll have the water wheel. I don't know how well you can see. It's bright sunlight, so I can't see what my screen is showing really. But right over here, we'll have the, the water wheel, which just arrived from the galvanizer on a truck. And I'm going to give you a quick tour around of the other elements. We have the floating platform. That's the big deck there. And everything gets bolted down to that and becomes the, becomes the uh, sort of the foundation for the whole thing. And it floats up and down with the different water levels. Um, the conveyor is up there. And we'll take a quick look at that. That's sort of the main piece, uh, one of the most important components, because that's where the, where the trash gets lifted from the river up out of the water and into a dumpster. And we're, ex we're anticipating that this trash wheel will probably get as much trash as any of the other trash wheels, maybe even a bit more. So of the 1,500 tons that we've collected so far, this one will probably add a good chunk every year to that number and um, probably in the neighborhood of 300 tons a year coming, coming down Gwynn's Falls that we'll get out of that river. So I'm gonna take a quick look around, hopefully that you can stay with me. And as I go up and show you some of these other 
pieces that are going to be put onto the trash wheel. Are, are you still with me? Okay. So right over here we have the conveyor. I think you can see that. And that conveyor is going to be lifted onto the floating platform in the next week or so. And we'll see all the pieces of that. And up in the shop, we have the rig system coming together and the piling brackets and some other assembly. The crew's hard at work. Uh, I told them not to make any noise, and they're, but they're ready to get back at it as soon as I'm done here. So that's a. Uh, I haven't even seen the water wheel since it's been back when I go, and I, but it's over there on the truck behind me, and I'll take a quick look at that in a second. I think I'll lose my Wi-Fi if I go over there, but uh, the water wheel's ready to go. All the components are ready to go, and this trash wheel's getting on the home stretch of joining the effort. You are, you are great and on schedule. So we appreciate that. And, uh, and with that, um, we will get, we're gonna start wrapping this up. But thank you, John. We are okay. excited to see the fourth trash wheel. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so um, thank you, I'm amazed. Uh, I just wanna thank all of our speakers for being so timely uh, and keeping us on schedule. I, I'm almost a little surprised that we are so on schedule right now. Um, but uh, so thank you to John, thank you, Jen Iosa, Tiffany Kim, Director Garbark, Council President Scott, and Michael Hankin. Uh, we also owe a huge thank you to Chelsea Onspach, who you didn't see today, but she's our communications manager. Um, and she's the one who made sure everything ran as smoothly as possible. Uh, thank you also to our president, Lori Schwartz, and the rest of the team at the Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors and our supporters uh, for making this work possible. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon and helping us to launch the next 10 years of creating a fishable and swimmable Baltimore Harbor. A link to the full report will be emailed to those of you who registered for this event. It will also be available on our website and social media immediately following this webinar. So thank you everybody for joining me this afternoon. Have a great day, have a great rest of your week. Uh, and you'll be hearing more from us soon, I'm sure. Thank you.